Thanks, Mig. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, my name is Nick Campbell. I run Grayscale Gorilla, where we make uh, 3D applications and software for Cinema 4D, uh, so like plugins. And then I also do uh, Banana Camera Company, which is like this iPhone uh, app making thing where we make your photos all messed up. But we'll talk about that later. Um, what I, what I, when I thought about Creative Mornings, I, I watch all these Creative Mornings uh, all around the world. Now they have in, in all these cities. And my favorite stories are from people that are kind of in a certain part of their career and they wanted to make a transition into the next part of their career and uh, they tell that story on how it worked and how it didn't work and, and if it was difficult and some of the things they learned along the way. And those are my favorite stories. Uh, so I figured I'd try to share a little bit about my story as well uh, as, as far as that goes. The, when Mig said this month was happiness, it's even more perfect because I think that drive from being somewhat satisfied to trying to be more satisfied in any creative career is driven by doing more of what makes you happy. So I think this will help out a lot. Um, and so I hope to just give you a little bit of a story on how I ended up where I was kind of like 80% happy and how I tried to transition into uh, a career and to do work that made me more like 92. You know, I'm, I'm still working on it. So um, it, all, it all starts when I got my first job when I was 15. Uh, it, that's kind of the age that my parents decided, get, get the hell out, get a job. Um, they still had me at their house. I'm not saying get out, but um, <laughs> go get a job. You're, you almost have a car. You're like, go, go start your, your stuff, you know? And it never dawned on me to just go get a job at some place that would hire me. It, it made more sense to me to go, what am I into? What, what can I do? What do I like doing anyway? And what can I go learn on the job and, and do that? Even when I was 15, I said, I didn't want to work in clothes. I didn't want to work in food. And I didn't want to work with kids. It just, <laughs> I was 15, you know, kids and food. I didn't want, to, I went, didn't want the typical like 15-year-old job. So I went to the mall, which is where you go when you're in the suburbs of Detroit growing up to get a job. And I started walking around looking at like where where I would want to work. I wanted to work at the record store. I was really into music. I was really, uh, you know, I was playing guitar and piano and all that stuff. And I wanted to work at maybe the science store. They had all those cool, like, toys and, and, you know, stuff to play with and books about space and stuff. But there were too many kids there. And then, um, <laughs> and then uh, maybe at the bookstore, they had all these magazines about, like, hi-fi stereos and, and home theaters and crap that I was into at the time. Uh, but I walked in kind of a past, and these little carts were new at the mall. They, they, they haven't always been there. I'm dating myself. But they, these kiosk things in the, in the center of the aisle of the mall were just popping up, and one of them sold magic tricks. And I go, I want to work there. So I walked up to him. There was a little sign. It was perfect. It said, we're hiring. And I walked up, and he goes, you know, do a magic trick. So he had cards. I pulled it out, and I, I memorized them all, you know, from those crappy books you get at Toys R Us or like, you know, those little kits with the hat and the crappy wand and all that. And I did a couple of them and he, and he said, you're hired. Uh, you know, learn these tricks. And my first job was standing in the middle of the mall, approaching people walking to go buy real stuff and then saying, hey, do you want to see a magic trick? Doing a trick. And then, and then they go, how do you do that? And I go, well, for $10. You could buy the book, or you could buy the fake deck, or you could buy the trick coins, and, and you could do this for your, your family, right? And, uh, and that was the first of, of, of quite a few jobs when I was younger, growing through high school and college, where I was mostly doing work that I liked doing. Uh, I was lucky enough to pull this off. You know, I was into music, so I ended up doing a lot of DJ work and playing music at weddings and bars and stuff. Uh, I was really you know, into playing guitar and, and recording and, and home recording, so I ended up recording my, ba my friend's bands and helping out with a record label um, to record uh, uh, some of their bands. Um, and through this magic thing, started doing things like you know, kids' birthday parties and dressing up like a clown and some stupid stuff like that. But somewhere around you know, 
early, when I should have been in college, basically. I graduated high school and I kind of screwed off for a couple, couple years. I ended up in Vegas for no reason, um, living there, and kind of had some odd jobs and this and that. Didn't know what to do. My parents wanted me to go to college, um, but I didn't know what that thing was that I could go study for four years. You know, I kind of, I didn't, I didn't know what that was until I saw this animation on late night TV, this weird channel. I think they bought up like public access time or something. It's called Burly Bear. And they showed all these art films and, and uh, music videos and, and just weird, this is like pre-YouTube stuff, like the stuff that would be on YouTube eventually. They would show all this crap. And one of the things that they played was this film by uh, MK12. So the logo flipped up. It said, MK12 presents Man of Action. And it showed five minutes of the coolest things I've ever seen. It was this short film, and it wasn't quite filmed. It wasn't filmed with a camera, right? It wasn't like a video thing. And it wasn't hand-drawn animation. It was this new thing. I didn't really know what, to, what, what it was called. And it was like photo cutouts, and they would jump around, and there was, there was 3D animation, and there was type flying everywhere. There were cards moving around. And, and it, was, it was exactly everything I loved about a lot of things. And at the end, it said, made by MK12. So I wrote that down. And it said, made with After Effects. And I wrote that down. And I looked up what After Effects was. And that was it for me. That was the next five years of my life. Uh, I got all the, all the tapes, all the VHS tapes. That dates me, too. All the VHS tapes I could find, um, all, the, all the stuff online I could find to learn this thing, I was obsessed. I came here to Chicago to go to school to learn after Effects and to learn motion graphics that I find, found out what it was called. And ended up uh, in, in a job that uh, did this and uh, moved around the city and, and learned a lot and ended up at Digital Kitchen, which uh, actually used to be right, right around here. Um, and to me, working at Digital Kitchen was the best place in Chicago to do what I wanted to do. I liked their work. I liked the style of their work. I liked um, uh, you know, their, their portfolio of work was right in line with the kind of stuff that I was into. And when I was working there, it's when I realized that these last four or five years, um, I should have been also studying something else. And that something else was really, really evident when I started looking at what I was making and starting comparing it to the, to the MK12s and the, and the digital kitchens of the world. I knew every button of After Effects. I studied it, I learned it, I read the manual, I read the books, I followed all the tutorials. What I didn't learn was any design concepts. None. I didn't know. I didn't know and I didn't care, frankly. I didn't get into this to be a designer. I didn't get into this to learn about typography. I didn't get into all this stuff because I needed to learn hierarchy. I didn't care about that stuff. I just wanted to make what was on TV and they said they used After Effects, and now I knew After Effects. Why was my shit so ugly? <laughs> and when I compared it, you know, there's that Ira Glass thing where he says there's that gap between where you are and where your heroes are. And when you look at that gap, it, it can be discouraging and say, I, you know, I'm going to compare my work to my heroes. And when you do that, it can be really kind of really, really sucky, especially when you're working in the same room with them. Uh, but the best part about that was that I was in the same room with them. I, and, and they were willing to look at my stuff and go, that's ugly, first of all. And, and they were willing to say why it was ugly, not how to fix it. Because anybody could go, hey, change this typeface to this, make this color here, do this, and now it's beautiful. Good job. But that's just them designing through me, right? They told me why it was ugly. They told me, don't use 18 typefaces, idiot. Don't use Comic Sans, dummy. Don't use that lasso typeface. Uh, you know, like, I didn't know these things. Um, you know, bright orange and bright green, don't put those together. Um, even though, I guess today I'm screwing it up. <laughs> I'll learn. Um, but they were, willing to get, they were willing to share their knowledge and tell me why. And I think that's, I think that's good advice no matter where you are in, in your career is don't be the best one in the room. Go be somewhere that you can learn from other people. Go be somewhere where you can be a little humbled by somebody else that's great. Because for me, that was the best part and, and the, the fastest time, uh, 
That was the quickest I've learned anything in my life, was this boot camp of people around me that were talented telling me why I sucked. And it was awesome. I learned so much. So I slowly got better. I was still, you know, I still, I basically have cheats now. I only use two typefaces ever, basically. Um, but uh, sitting at, at Digital Kitchen, we got to work on some really cool stuff. I got to work on movie title sequences and TV show stuff and stuff for the Super Bowl, stuff my mom would actually see. This was cool. Like, I made it, right? And uh, meanwhile, I was still doing all this other stuff. And this is, where, this is where it starts to shift from the traditional career path of, of kind of graduating and then going to work in the typical thing. So, you know, your, your guidance counselor at college or whatever would say, you know, you can go freelance. You can go work at a bigger agency type place, or you can go work for like a smaller boutique place like Digital Kitchen or you know, somebody more specialized. Um, and those were kind of the three options. Those were kind of the, the three things that everybody kind of went and did after, after college. And right around that time is when I started realizing there were other ways to play around with all this stuff. Because honestly, my favorite part about all this was playing with After Effects. And then I got into 3D and then playing around with Cinema 4D. I mean, those were the most fun days I've had was learning what all these tools can do and how to make beautiful stuff. Because that's why I did, that's why I got into this. I saw, I saw the MK12 thing, I said, that, I want to make that. And it's, I'm still struggling to get there. That's been the whole thing. But I didn't get into this to make work for clients necessarily. They just happen to be paying, you know? Um, so right around that time, a few things happened that, that lined up to allow me to, to think about things a little bit differently. And I think this comes up a lot in, in a lot of people's careers, is I got to where I wanted to go. Um, I, I am working at a place where I thought I wanted to work, and, and I'm still not 100% happy. Um, you know, it, some of the things aren't great. Maybe it's the clients, maybe it's the people you work with, maybe it's not being, you know, you being the best in the room and not having anybody to learn. You feel like you're stagnant, you're going sideways. And a few things happened. So the first thing that happened was this website popped up in, uh, that I didn't know existed. It was called iStock Photo. And it's just a stock photography thing, but somehow that was the first one I saw. And what they said was, hey, upload photos. We're, if we approve them, we're going to put them in our store. And if anybody buys it, if anybody searches for your photo and they find value in what you uploaded, they could buy it and we'll give you a percentage, basically. We'll give you a couple dimes. And uh, that was interesting to me. I could do work now and maybe get paid later. That didn't dawn on me as, as a career option, ever. And iStock was this really weird way to, to try it without too much risk, right? And the cool part was I had photos. I, took, I started a photo blog in 2004, four-ish, uh, where I posted a photo a day. So I had my camera around me all the time. I took photos of everything and great photos, crappy, mostly crappy photos. I posted the good ones, right? One a day, I found my favorite one, I posted it. But what I had was this hard drive absolutely full of other photos that I didn't necessarily want to put on my blog, but I thought might be useful to somebody. You know, the typical like stuff you shoot when you start being a photographer. You're like building, 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 sunset, water, cab driving by. <laughs> Uh, shadow in the grass, right? So I looked through all my, so I, I made it a project. I said, I'm going to go through all my photos and I'm going to um, look for stuff that might be valuable to other people. Some of it was textures of bricks and grass and all this stuff. So I just started kind of putting those aside, processing them, cleaning them up, uploading to the site. I must have had 20 of them. And I checked back a few days later and there was like five bucks in the account. And, I, and it took a weekend, and then a week later, there was five bucks. And I thought, well, that's cool. I did work here and did ne didn't necessarily get paid, but now I have five bucks. And what's really cool is, theoretically, if I don't do anything for another week, there might be five more dollars in there. In other words, I don't have to trade an hour for an hour's pay. I could trade an hour for potentially unlimited pay on the future. And it was just a really small, subtle difference to think about it that way. But that changed the way I thought about my creative work in, in that I can go do stuff I already did. I already liked doing, going and walking out shooting photos, and potentially share those with other people. And if there's value in that, in that photo, I could potentially get paid on that photo or that work later. 
And what I didn't realize is that's like, you know, what businesses do. You know, that's what most like entrepreneur kind of things that's, th but those weren't words in my head. I just wanted to make pretty stuff on TV. Um, so when iStock turned into adding video, it blew up for me. I was done. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm my own client now. I'm going to think about all these cool things I can animate and learn. And it was also the perfect learning tool to learn Cinema 4D, which was what I was really into at the time, as well as After Effects, was this new 3D animation tool that I wanted to just learn and play with. So what I would do on the weekends is say, I'm going to make this logo spin around, or I'm going to make the world rotate in 3D, and that's going to be my stock thing that I upload this weekend. And I would sit and learn Cinema 4D enough to figure out how to make a world rotate and make it, and then do it, and, and then upload it and see what happens. So that was going on. Uh, at the same time, uh, this Grayscale Gorilla site, which was my photo blog, I added like a secondary blog to it, where I started talking about how I took photos. I talked about how I did After Effects stuff. I talked about my job. I talked about how I, how work is at, at Digital Kitchen and all that kind of stuff. That was ta that was growing in 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 importance to me. I loved talking to other people on it. I was doing tutorials with for After Effects and all this stuff. So that was a little segment of it. And um, I also, the iPhone came out, and the, and the app, significantly, the App Store came out, and that's, that's when I looked at uh, all these photography apps and said, I want to I wanna make that. I mean, I've, I've been trying to emulate film through Photoshop for two years, you know? It's ever since I uh, started getting into photography and playing with film, I was like, I know I can make this work. I know I can make, you know, film, I know I can make a filter in Photoshop that makes it look more like film, because it's so beautiful. So I had, I had the filter, it was ready to go. When the iPhone came out and I looked at it and I saw all these kind of crappy photo uh, apps popping up, I said, I want my filter in an app. How do I do that? So I hired a developer and it wasn't too much money. I said, I'm going to try this. This is like the first time. I'm not just trading time for potential pay later. I was actually putting money down and saying, I'm going to put money down that we are going to build this. And same with the App Store, you could build it once and potentially, if there's value, people can buy that over time, and, and, you can, and you don't have to trade that hour for an hour's pay, or a day for a day's pay, or a, a, a project for a project's pay. And uh, that, so that happened. And then the, the, real, the key that turned the whole thing was at the same time, around 2004 or 5, all these other companies and people started talking about the transition from client work to making stuff for themselves, so and, and all in Chicago. So I was, you know, guys like uh, Jim Kudal, Kudal Partners, who talked at Creative Mornings, uh, uh, Jason Freed, 37 Signals, uh, and even Jake from Threadless. They all stood up here and said, we had that transition from, um, from kind of more client work, traditional, and, and moving into work that we wanted to do for ourselves. And that was the key that turned it. Because what I saw was, if they, if they could do that, then, then I could do that. I, I, I'm really a subscriber. This is a little cheesy, but I'm super like, subscribed to the idea that what one man can do, another can do. If, if they can do that and transition out of client work because they weren't 100% happy, and they thought they could have more control and have more fun doing it their way, I thought I could do this. So all four of these things lined up in a way that made me look at my career, I guess, or my path on this. And I decided that I wasn't, I, I needed to make a change. I wanted to spend more and more time on the projects that I liked and less and less time on some of the projects I didn't like doing at my job. Now, I was 80% happy there. I got to work with great people. I got to work um, and learn a lot. But those little things about clients and all the little stuff I didn't like, I thought I could take a chance, so I did. I left um, Digital Kitchen in 2009 with the idea that I wasn't going to take any client work for a year. And if it all blew up, blew up in my face, I knew that I could either crawl back to DK and ask for my job back, or if they wouldn't have me, maybe somebody else in the city. But the risk at that point was just trying it. It was a year. And if, again, if everything blew up, I knew as long as my arm didn't get cut off in the process, I could go use my Wacom pen and make stuff for other people. So I did, I left. And in the last three years, Grayscale Gorilla has gone from a community of um, you know, Cinema 4D artists and After Effects artists to now a business where I make software and plugins for those people to use in their work. 
the iPhone um, banana camera company, which is the iPhone business, we've worked on that and made uh, upgrades to the current ones. We're working on a new application, and, and that's a blast to play with. And now I get to work with all my friends that are doing creative work in an office up the, up the road here, and they get to, I get to learn from them. Right? It's this whole process of not being the best in the room and growing through that. So um, I wanted to tell one more story. I think like a couple minutes, Meg. Um, and it's a kind of a silly story, but I, I think it ties in all this. Um, I, last year, I got really into pinball, pinball machines. Ding, 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 ding. And uh, I always played them when I was younger, but la somehow last year I got the bug. And, uh, I started like learning about them, and this happens all the time with, with other with other things in my life. I'll I'm into something, and then I realize, wait, a man made this. Like everything around you, like <laughs> the projector and the screen and the computer, like people were involved with this. And this, it, I have this realization. I need to like get the tattoo on me. Like everything around us is made by people that are interested in making that thing. So when I found out that actual men made pinball machines, that was it. Like I needed to know. All my favorite designers of pinball machines. There's different styles of machines. There's different rules, rule sets based on who made it. There's different games based on what companies made it. There's, there's the history of the designers coming through. There's rock star designer pinball machine guys. Can you believe that? So I, got, I was hooked, right? So I started collecting games. Uh, we have eight of them now at the office. Um, <laughs> we would have more if we had more room. Uh, I, I started talking about this publicly, you know, like being all nerdy about it, be like, did you know people make pinball machines? And, and writing that and, um, and sharing this on Twitter, you know, I'd post my high score in a local bar and say, somebody come beat it, suckers. And then, uh, and what happened was I got a phone call. I got a phone call from a guy that said, hey, I think um, we want your help. We're building a pinball machine. Uh, we're a brand new pinball machine company and we're building our first pinball machine and we want you to help. And I go, holy crap, uh, how can I help? Um, I don't know anything about pinball machines. And they said, well, we have the first pinball machine with a TV in the back of it. It's not the little red dots anymore. We want a full TV, HD TV in the back glass that plays full res animation during the game. And we heard that you're into animation, you're into After Effects and 3D and all this stuff, which we need. And we also heard you're really nerdy into pinball. And I said, heck yeah, I will help. That was my first uh, freelance or, or, or client since I've left. And I had to say yes. Um, and I went, and, and so I worked on it. And the owner of the company was really proud of his first game. And it's, it's coming out soon. And he was so proud of everybody that helped on it that he had everybody sign their name and he put it on the game. So now I went from getting into pinball to, putting, to having my name on a pinball machine in a year. And I, I say that not to brag, although I think it's really cool. <laughs> but I say that because being loud and passionate and showing other people what you are really into can never hurt. I've never, I've never, I've always benefited from being, showing my passion, too much of it. Being loud about what I, what I like, what I don't like, and, and off, also offering help. When people make the phone call, when you get that call, say yes. Answer it and say, I can help. How can I help? And I think that there's, um, I think I, I hear people talk about being in a creative space where they got in, into it for one reason, but now they're working in a space that's kind of related to how they, why they got into this in the first place, but not quite. Maybe you really liked making posters and screen printing and now you're doing website stuff. Still talk about that screen printing, still go do that stuff. Let people know that this is still your passion, even though you're kind of sideways into it. Um, th this, is, this is also a little cheesy, but I really believe that everything benefits by you guys doing exactly what makes you happy. Um, the, the world, the community, uh, the, your, your, your friendships, and you all benefit by you doing what makes you happy for a couple reasons. If you are in a job, that doesn't make you happy, get the hell out and let somebody else do it that does make it happy for them. And the second thing is, is you will make better stuff. Everything around us that's made by humans, by, made by people, by men, 
is made by creative people that are interested and solve a problem. And I think that that is the best thing you could do is go be happy. Um, good luck with that. Thanks for having me, guys. Nick, that was an awesome story. So I have a couple of questions for you before we uh, flip to the audience. Well, maybe three. First, orange and green, have you heard of Trump Club? Yeah, no, I need help, guys. I mean, <laughs> green, orange, it's bad. I have, uh, green, I have green shoes on, by the way. So one thing that I, I really noticed as you told your story is that you have this innate sense of, you, you just love learning things. More than even making things and making polished things, you just love learning After Effects. You spent half a decade learning After Effects, and then another four years learning C4D. But then now, a lot of people know you as, as a teacher, and you teach everything you know. So tell us a little bit about this joy you get from helping people, from just learning a bunch of stuff to now telling the whole world everything you know. Like, why, um, why switch to that? Yeah, you know, I, I think that obviously learning stuff is really fun. You get into that new project or that new thing you're into and you start, you start learning all this stuff and you get to this plateau of where you can't maybe necessarily learn more about the actual software, but then you have, for me at least, I have this another level I can, I can use with that knowledge, which is show other people. And so if, you, if, if I can get to a level where I'm comfortable with my skills or enough to do it, I can actually have more fun by showing other people. The other thing, the other thing about teaching that I like is that it's not necessarily that I'm some guru that has been doing this for 10 years and now I get to tell you. It's like in a lot of cases with our tutorials and what we do, I will learn a really cool technique that day that we've been working on for a week and then put the tutorial out tomorrow. So it's like, here's what I learned yesterday if, and if it helps you guys even better. So for me, sharing and, and training and all that stuff has been um, half an excuse for me to remember it, because I watch my own tutorials sometimes, um, and, uh, but, more, but more a way to share what I know, and I've, I've gotten more out of sharing what I know than, than holding on to it, for sure. Cool. And another thing that you know, differs with you and with a lot of designers when they make the switch is you go from doing service-based work, working for clients, to now your own product, and now you figured out how to make residual income. What is that like? like how did you figure that out? When did the light bulb click and what, do you have, what, what kind of advice do you have for these aspiring designers who also want to make residual income? Um, you know, for, for me it was, all the stories are out there. I, I'm a product of all these, these, those stories from 37 Signals and Kudal and, and I'm a student of theirs whether they know it or not. This knowledge of, of switching from, from more traditional client-based, you know, full-time work to becoming basically making stuff for yourself, um, that, all that knowledge is out there. So for me, it wasn't a magic light bulb moment. It was learning from all these people that were willing to share that story with me and then following that advice and trying it. Something like iStock Photo was kind of a no-risk thing. It was some time to try, and I tried it, and, and traction was there. So, uh, and you hear this said by, other, by all these other people that say this, you don't have to, you don't have to do a big jump to, to try these things. You could try this right now in your current situation. Cool. How about questions from the audience? Yeah. Do it. Anyone? There we yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I repeat the question for the audio. Uh, I think the question, I hope I get it right, uh, is, is talking about this stuff, being interested in like 
sharing your ideas on, this, on a stage, how do, you, how do you get better at that, maybe? Um, I, uh, I, I, um, I like talking. If you notice, something that makes me happy is talking a lot. Um, so when, when I used to go to portfolio shows and stuff, when I worked at Digital Kitchen, we'd go look at new work. And we'd always leave and sit at lunch and talk about all the things the students could have done better to get hired, basically. you know. And uh, the first speaking gig I did was basically on that subject, like go to a school and say, hey, you're about, you know, you're just starting, you're graduating, and how, what, what makes you stand out when you graduate from this art school or whatever? And so for me, I naturally had a, too many opinions about stuff. Um, and speaking, I still get, you know, I get all nervous and, you know, anxious about stuff. But for me, as far as not having slides up there, uh, Slides kind of lock me into this really linear way of, of talking that kind of um, is less sporadic and maybe makes more sense at the end, but it's way less en energy. Um, and I have, I have more fun when there's not slides, and I think that everybody else does too, because I don't, um, I can just go off on tangents and, and hopefully it makes sense at the end. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But I think the energy is much higher without slides. Slides are, I mean, the worst of slides are just like reading them, you know, like, and then you want to do this. Next slide, and then you want to do this. So for me, you know, having a couple notes, knowing maybe in general what you want to say is the way to, to approach that. Um, yeah, the question is, uh, have I ever run into a place where I kind of get writer's block or don't know what to make next? Um, I, uh, I do all the time. I, I do not, it's not a steady stream of stuff. Uh, there is there's high energy times, and there's times where it's just like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. One thing I, one thing I thrive on is setting a deadline. I've always, like when I had the photo blog where it was a f like one photo a day, I knew that by the end of the day, I needed to post a photo. So that got my brain going, and that got me carrying my camera everywhere. It also got me like really stressing out about taking a, a good photo. Um, and so short deadlines for me um, help a lot. So now we do a lot of software. We do a lot of development. We do a lot of little projects. Nothing's longer than a week or two, because I, you know, I think long projects tend to like you kind of screw around for two weeks. Like if you have a month, you screw around for two weeks, and then you work for two weeks. Um, so I just shorten it and just be like, you know, we're just going to work for two weeks. Basically, either put out what is done at the end of two weeks or decide that it's not worth it and then move on. So that, that's been our uh, internal at, at, the, at the company, kind of the way that we work. Uh, and I think, I think deadlines cure writer's block, frankly. Yeah, um, so the question is, is it, do I do any client work? And if not, what do, what do I do all day, basically? <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, other than the pinball machine, uh, I, haven't, I haven't done any freelance or client work since I left in, in 2009. Um, but uh, as far as what we do, yeah, projects, are, projects for us are sometimes based on that original idea of looking at something that we really like, and we want to know how it's made. So that's been a lot of what we do now at Grayscale Gorilla. We'll find a commercial or an effect or some sort of interesting, cool new thing that, is, that we want to know how to do. And we'll sit for a week and try to dissect it and try to like backwards engineer how they did that cool logo effect with the explosion and then the, and then the little letters come in and then it all comes together at the end. We'll go like, that was cool. Let's, let's build that. So we'll spend all week making that and then we'll put out a... a a tutorial to show like some of the techniques that we've learned through the through that week basically that's been our internal project kind of system the other thing that we do is um, we try to do a lot of kind of work and help our our friends when they need a, a logo animation or when they need a little help with cinema 4d or after effects or whatever we kind of try to help out and then you know kind of tr help show what we helped out with so some of the things on the blog are like hey we did we helped do this with with this artist 
Uh, this is what he had a problem with. We kind of sat down and played with it. And then now all of you guys are here to, to learn from it. So any project now that we take isn't, doesn't give us money, but it, it allows us to um, create training and, and learning from that experience and instantly get it out there. So, and, and as far as, you know, the, the other stuff's like the, the plugins and all that stuff. So we, we develop plugins and software for, for Cinema 4D. That's where, well, that's where a lot of time goes as well. <laughs> Uh, the, so the question is, when I jumped from, from out of full time into my own thing, how did I, how did I not stress out about money? Um, and the, the way I did it was it wasn't just I decided to just jump out. I didn't just go, I'm not 100% happy, I'm leaving. Um, what I did was start to try those little projects and things like iStock where, where money was starting to come in. So I could look at my account and say, you know, now I have not just 10, 20 photos, but now I have 100 photos and 50 animations that are in the system and people seem to like them and buy some of them. And I could look at that and say, that's definitely not my salary, but I had some sort of cushion. I also had a timeline. So it, if, if I jumped and it all went to hell, I had a timeline that to, to go back, you know? And I, I, I wasn't burning a bridge. I was just like leaving for a little bit. So if everything went, if everything really went south, I could go get a paycheck again. You know what I mean? So it, that, was, that was helpful. So having a little bit of a safety cushion to know that I could try this for a year, you know, and then knowing that you can go back was, was for me. I mean, I, I really don't subscribe to the whole like, quit your job now and go figure it out thing. So like try those little projects. Kickstarter is huge for this now. I mean, to, to try out a project and see what you can, see what you can do with an idea and and some friends, you know? Uh, and then if that turns into something, it's a good transition. Very cool. Nick, so how can we get a hold of you and follow up with all the things you and the Grayscale Gorilla crew are doing? Oh boy. Well, you can go to grayscalegorilla.com, uh, but you can follow me uh, on the Twitters or yell at me or tell me my t-shirt sucked at <laughs> Nick, uh, Nick Vegas at, on the Twitters. Uh, and then you can go to my, oh, my pinball blog. You can, you can learn all about pinball at uh, uh, Quick Multiball, quickmultiball.com. Um, but uh, yeah, hit me up. Uh, Twitter's probably the best, best bet. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, guys.